Hey everyone, welcome to Generative Now. I am Michael Magnano. I'm a partner at Lightspeed. From the moment you sign onto your computer at work, you are inundated with emails and messages. And that's exactly where Grammarly comes in. Grammarly has been using AI to streamline and improve communication well before Gen AI was a thing. I sat down and talked with the CEO of Grammarly, Raul Roy Chowdhury. He's a great perspective on AI products. He's Grammarly's former global head of product before he came CEO. And then before Grammarly, he spent 14 years at Google as a VP and product leader across many different categories. We talked about the future of AI agents and tools, privacy and security when it comes to AI, and why Raul sees Gen AI as a tool for co-creation. Check out this conversation with Raul Roy Chowdhury, the CEO of Grammarly. Uh, hey, Raul, thank you so much for doing this. Michael, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. You know, I, I'm really interested in hearing a little bit about your experience. I feel like you've had you've had quite the journey. You spent many years at Google, um, and and now obviously you're the you're the CEO of Grammarly. W would you mind just taking us taking us back a little bit and giving uh, giving us a little bit about your story? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you go way way back, I was actually uh, in a PhD program in AI. So my initial goal in life was to be an AI researcher many years ago before AI was cool. Yeah. I dropped out of, a, of the program. I didn't finish my PhD. I think it's required to drop out of some sort of an academic program. <laughs> that's what I did. Especially um, if you're going to be a CEO. That's right. That's right. So, uh, so, so I did that. But I've always been thinking about AI. It's always been something that's on my mind. It's something I've had a lot of interest in for many decades. And man, just seeing the changes that AI is driving today is absolutely incredible. Incredible. Um, in my career, I've, I've, it's been interesting. I've had a pretty interesting uh, kind of a vantage point to see some pretty big changes in tech. Uh, so for example, like one of the big changes was I was working on the Chrome team as I, I spent many years on Chrome. And uh, we saw the change from desktop to mobile. And, you know, we were a successful product. Uh, we, were, we had built this browser for desktops and we were doing quite well. Um, and then mobile came along and it represented a really interesting kind of uh, way to think about what is a new platform? What does that mean? Initially, we thought, well, I guess we'll just shrink down the desktop product and just ship the shr shrunk product onto on mobile devices because it seems like a smaller version of desktop. And it took us a while to recognize, no, it's not a shrunk down desktop. It is a completely new platform. And it seems obvious in retrospect, but it wasn't obvious then to us. It took us a while to get that journey. and then. I just saw the incredible opening up that mobile presented to com access to computation. People got their first devices in many parts of the world uh, through a low-end Android smartphone. And it was, right. it was transformational for, to, for billions of people. So that was awesome. Then I saw the big shift from on-prem to cloud, you know, uh, kind of seeing how that opens up the aperture for any entrepreneur with a good idea, any founding team with a good idea, getting it built without worrying about all the operational details, uh, being able to scale their business extremely efficiently. Again, transformative. So it's really awesome to see these waves of tech transformation. You know, I saw mobile, I saw uh, cloud, and now AI is bigger and more consequential than any of those other things and we're living it. I, I was actually gonna ask you that, that exact question. Yeah. Like how would you compare what is happening or what will happen with AI to these other platform shifts. Sounds like you feel like it's gonna be even more consequential than the shift to mobile, the internet, cloud, yeah. is that right? I think it's gonna be way more consequential, but I also okay. think that it's gonna take a while for AI to fully play out. There's always a bit of a hype cycle that ends up happening with these things and we end up all, always overshooting in the short term and undershooting in the long term. Like, you know, even if you look at cloud, you know, AWS launched in 2006. This thing has been going on for 18 years and it's still not done yet. There's yeah. still kind of people are moving from on-prem to the cloud. So these platform shifts are massively disruptive, but they also take a while to play out. And so we just got to recognize that, you know, there's going to be a journey for adoption and value creation. You got to always keep your eye on the prize on what are we actually doing to help make users' lives better? Because ultimately yeah. that is the test. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, those of us who are in tech, whether we're on the operating side or in venture or, yeah. you know, whatever, we're we're all living, breathing this stuff basically 24-7 right now. All we talk about is AI. Yeah, um, yeah. But like, you know, the litmus test that I like to I, I like to apply to things is like, well, are my parents talking about this stuff? Are my kids talking about it? You know, people that I don't know in tech. 
And yeah, I mean, I think per your point, not everyone's talking about it yet. Not everyone. I mean, a lot of people are using it. Not, not everyone realizes they're using it yet. So I, so I think I agree. Like we're probably a few years off from where, you know, what everyone in the world has an iPhone or an Android device. And it's, yeah, people talk about it, but also really to be super crisp on how is it making my life better? Like give right. me some very concrete examples in which AI is actually helping me do a thing better, faster, more accurately, uh, giving me superpowers. Like we got to really nail those use cases and kind of expand that set of use cases. That's how what's going to lead to widespread adoption. Yeah, I think that's right. Flip side, just thinking thinking out loud of it a little bit, you know, yeah. I, I don't know that most people think about the cloud in that way. And so what, the thing that I wonder is, you know, is AI going to be the type of shift that's very top of mind for everyone in the world? Or is it going to be more in the background, like the cloud, where it's had obviously massive, massive consequential impact, but it's kind yeah. of invisible. It's behind the scenes. You know, I think, okay, so let's take cloud as an example. The way I see it is initially my very simplified view of cloud adoption over the last 15 years is it started out as, I don't know what this cloud thing is. I'll take some low risk workloads and stick it in the cloud. Like I remember most common use case was I have a dis disaster recovery site. I have some servers sitting, maybe I have an investment bank in New York. I have servers sitting in Hoboken. That's my disaster recovery site, you know, where you are. Um, and uh, let's move that to the cloud. And there's some cost yeah. savings and it's very clear. And then you're like, all right, that worked. That's great. Now, what else can I do? And then you start moving more workloads to the cloud. And then it becomes sort of a, all right, I'm removing CapEx. I'm moving to OpEx. I have elasticity in, 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 in my compute capacity, et cetera. That's great. Then you realize one day that, wow, 60, 70% of my critical business apps are in the cloud. That enables me to rethink how I do my business. Like it, it enables me to connect my apps together. It enables me to get insights from what used to be previously siloed. And so over time, new opportunities open up. And I think right. ultimately cloud did transform how businesses run and operate, but it didn't happen overnight. It's like I put it in the cloud, I got some cost savings, great. And now I see what cloud can actually enable for me. And I think AI is gonna be similar. It's yeah. an incredibly powerful piece of tech. We're going to start using AI in different ways. And then we're going to realize, you know, this workflow that I have that has like 15 steps. Now that I've got AI enabled in every step of this workflow, I can actually rethink the workflow from the ground up and I can do my work differently. So I think we're going to go on this journey uh, on AI and it's not going to be a quick journey, but I think that is right. the journey and that's what's going to lead to transformation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, your, your career has been fascinating. You know, you spent many years at Google. We touched on it very briefly. Um, I think initially as a, as a product manager, which yeah. I, I've always viewed the product manager role as sort of um, kind of like being the CEO of a feature or a product. And now you're the CEO of, of Grammarly, a, a company that's, I think, I think last valued at, at nearly $13 billion. Like what, what has, what was that journey like? You know, going from a product leader uh, to you know, I don't know, I don't know what your first the first thing was that you focused on as a product leader yeah. at, at Google yeah. to now leading this this incredibly beloved product and brand. It's been uh, it's been a phenomenal journey. Uh, you know, I, I spent many years at Google, as you said, almost fifteen years at Google. Wow. And uh, the reason I joined Grammarly was I really I really felt a deep sense of affinity to the mission of the company. Uh, our mission at Grammarly is to improve lives by improving communication. And that's always been my North Star is, you know, how do I use my time in the most impactful way possible? Like, can, can, am I working on something that I can really be proud of? Maybe it will be successful, maybe it will not. But like, I really want to align on if we are successful, the outcome is something that I'm really, that's good for the world, that's good for in terms of the impact we can have in a positive way. Like, Thinking back on, you know, early days of Chrome, when I joined Chrome, Chrome success was very far from assured. It became very successful, but back in those days, definitely not obvious at all that that was going to happen. But I was really attracted to this idea of making the web platform better. And I felt like, you know, the web is great. No, no there are no gatekeepers. You don't need permission. You just innovate. That seems like a very worthwhile mission. So I'm in. I'm just going to sign up and we're going to see what we can do with it. And so Grammarly, was very similar to me in that sense. It was a really amazing mission that I wanted to sign up for, join Grammarly. Um, and uh, it's a it's an amazing company which just people love the product. I've never encountered this much product love. And I keep telling folks who've been at Grammarly a long time that 
this is not normal. Like, uh, you know, right. people genuinely just have this incredible affinity for the product. Uh, so we built something really special. I can't take credit for it. This has happened way before I joined. Right. The team has built something really special. And now AI has created a huge tailwind for us. Uh, and now we take our mission. We want to improve lives by improving communication. We can execute on our mission in a much more substantial way using AI. So this is great. And so yeah. my journey to CEO was really rooted in that. I joined Grammarly to make this mission come to life. And if I can do it as a head of product, if I can do it as a CEO, I'm in. And I just want to get this mission, uh, you know, uh, moving forward. That's awesome. When, when I think about Grammarly, uh, is, it, is it fair to say that Grammarly has kind of always been an AI product, even before AI was cool, right? I mean, like, you've always been there. Yeah. Right at the cursor, right where the 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 user is communicating them, and and yeah. leveraging some level of intelligence yeah. to help them communicate better. Is, is, yeah, it's it, funny. Has it always been AI. It's funny actually. So some of us maybe curmudgeonly get get a little annoyed that AI has become equated to Gen AI. Right. Like, wait, right. Yeah, a lot more than that. But I think I think that ship has sailed. So I'm, I'm not yeah. going to, you know, fight that. Don't fight like it. Don't fight yeah, it. So, so let's move on. But, you know, so like if you think about the journey of Grammarly, it started out, so it's always oriented to the mission. We want to help people uh, improve lives by improving communication. We want to help people communicate better. So back in the early days, there was no, there was no gen AI. There was no deep learning either. Uh, there were no kind of scaled out neural networks. What we did have was NLP, natural language processing with rule-based systems. And so Grammarly said, all right, well, what can I do with the technology that I have available to me. And it sounds like uh, NLP is very amenable to grammar correction because it is all really based on these grammatical rules. So that's where we started. We said, okay, we can actually start with making, helping people be correct in their communication using NLP. That's the technology we have. We can make progress. As deep learning and sort of scaled ML pipelines became more prevalent, we realized, hey, you know what? We could actually help people with more than just grammar checking. We could do things like helping people with uh, conciseness or clarity or tone. And so we started annotating data sets. In fact, we brought a lot of linguists. Uh, we hired a lot of linguists to help us with our NLP rules. And then those same linguists who are language experts, world-class researchers in language evolution, those same linguists said, uh, were, were, were kind of tasked with Let's start annotating high quality training data for ML pipelines to enable tone detection, tone correction. And so then we started moving from NLP to adding on a bunch of ML based features, moving beyond grammar. And now with LLMs, I feel like that's the next evolution, which is LLMs enable us to do way more. One of the things that enable us enable us to do is move beyond the revision phase. You know, it's like think about the life cycle, like life cycle of communications. You know, it's, I, I'm thinking about what I want to say. It's kind of a conception phase or ideation phase. Then I kind of compose it. I write it down. Then I revise it. I make it better. And then I send it to some people or a person or group of people and they comprehend it. So there's this entire life cycle. We've always focused on the revision phase of this life cycle, but Gen AI enables us to actually extend beyond that to the entire life cycle. And so that's the journey we're on. So it's always been an AI company to answer your question. And we keep taking in new AI techniques and improving on them, but it's always to, in service of these use cases that we care about for our users. So with, with NLP and sort of rule-based NLP, um, yeah. you know, it almost sounds like you're, you're looking at every part of the sentence and you're just following a list of instructions effectively. You mentioned that the LLM is sort of the next level. Does Does LLM, does using an LLM almost just like, kind of wipe out all of the groundwork you had to lay with NLP because it just kind of does everything? Like, is it is it is it that powerful that it can kind of do it all compared to what you you previously did? LLMs are extremely powerful. And I think we haven't even seen kind of, uh, I, I, we haven't seen the asymptote on the power right. yet. Right. It's still seemingly like getting more and more powerful with every generation. But I think everything we do ends up being accretive. So okay. for example, we create these rules we uh, kind of fine tune these rules based on user feedback. So users will accept or reject suggestions. And we have, we serve 30 million users. So we get a ton of user feedback. All of that user feedback data helps us fine tune LLMs. 
and fine tune our existing models and our new models based on user feedback. So it all adds up and it, it's all accretive and it just makes the quality of our experience better. To, to the extent you can share, do you leverage, you know, some of the bigger closed source models out there or is this all your own stuff? We do a mix of things. Um, okay. I think the dust hasn't settled on what the right architecture is. Is it going to be one model to rule them all? Is it going to be multiple models? My personal sense, just I don't know if I have a, a very scientific def defense of it, but my personal sense is there's going to be multiple models um, and they're going to be kind of fine-tuned for specific tasks and use cases. Um, and in any case, that's kind of the architecture we have put in place. So we have multiple models. We use some open source models. Big fan of open source, happy to talk more about it, but I think that is the future that I wish for, for AI. So we take some open source models, we fine tune it on our data. We also use closed source models. We use GPT um, as well. And so we kind of are seeing a plethora of options with the kind of foundation models. And we're that, I think that's great. That's great for people like us because we can just take from that great foundation layer and then tailor it and fine tune it to our specific use cases. Got it. You you mentioned that open source is the the future you you wish for. Uh, say more. Tell tell us about some of your thoughts on open source. Yeah, I you know so uh, back in the early days on Chrome, we also open sourced uh, Chromium. Yeah, Chromium. And uh, funnily enough, years later, like after I left Chrome and left Google, uh, Microsoft Edge is now based on Chromium. Right. And I think that's a wonderful testament to open source. Like you kind of keep contributing to this product. You keep hardening it. You keep making it resilient and, you know, kind of by, by just exposing it to daylight. And ultimately you get a very, very strong product. And now you have amazing browser engineers from Microsoft and from Google making the web safer for everyone. I think that's just a great outcome. So in general, I feel like open source is our path forward. Uh, AI is extremely powerful technology. Um, we don't quite know the parameters of where the different vectors of risk and harm are. We're kind of figuring this out as we go. And I think we'll never fully know. I think we'll always be kind of like learning as we deploy this in the field and get feedback. And we're like, oh, this is a new thing that we never thought of. Someone kind of created a new attack surface that we never even imagined. And like, we got to deal with it. The best way to navigate through all of that is by just making these models open so everyone can test it, probe it, push for it. And there's some people who push back on this, uh, but ultimately in my experience and my firm belief, really open source is the way to make these models safe and useful in the long term. So I'm actually seeing a ton of progress on it. Like Llama 3 was an exciting Incredible. development for people like, like me who really care about open source. Um, and so um, we open source our own models. We, we build something. Oh, wow. Seismograph, which is like a, um, a sensitive text detector. So it's like, you know, um, a model is emitting some output. Uh, what if it's sensitive output? Mm. Um, and so we actually have done a lot of work to detect that. And then you as, a, as an app provider can say, well, it looks like the model has generated some sensitive output. Let me take some evasive action. Like maybe I won't show it to the user or maybe I'll do something else. Uh, and so we built that technology. We've open sourced it. So we are contributing as well to the to the community. That sounds like it could be really, really useful for responsible AI and yeah. you know other models and, and companies, as you mentioned, products leveraging yeah. it just for AI safety. That's um, right. that, that that's that's really smart. And uh, I'm sure the community uh, appreciates you putting that back out into the into the ecosystem. Since we're on the topic of browsers, maybe this is getting yeah. a little bit away from Grammarly, but there's plenty for us to come back to there. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people in in the comp topic of AI talk about how the browser and sort of the data within a browser is going to become such a pivotal playing field when it comes to AI, right? If you just think about how much information flows through your browser on a daily yeah. basis, you know, are we going to see the the sort of the main battleground for for consumer attention shift away from devices like iPhone and Android devices more into the browser where there's just such data density for models to train off of? Maybe, but I, I don't feel like that is going to be the main battleground. I think, okay. the, I think the game is going to be much richer uh, and fine-grained uh, telemetry on the, at, at the user level. 
Um, but like, if I just look at my own use of my MacBook, I'm sitting here, I use a bunch of tools at work. Some stuff is in the browser, some isn't. Like I'm using a Zoom app, yeah. it's a native application. I use Slack, it's a native application. I use a couple of other native applications. I also use browser apps. Um, I use different devices. And so I think it's less about what is the kind of the window and the container in which I'm collecting data, but it's more about how can I make sure that I'm getting all the relevant data? Uh, how can I make sure that I'm actually getting user permission and I have the user trust to collect this data because clearly there's value back? Um, and then how can I actually generate insights uh, to provide that value to users? If I'm collecting data from a bunch of different applications, how do I then synthesize that to provide value back to users? Um, I think that's going to be that's going to be really the key thing. One of the key pillars of Grammarly to connect the browser Grammarly thing is I do think user trust is one of the key pivotal kind of uh, attributes that are going to you know, kind of make or break success in this area. It's something we've been focused on for a decade. It's also something that's kind of hard to retrofit after the you can't like launch a thing and then come back later and say, all right, now let's figure out trust. You really got to yeah. have that kind of baked in from the ground up. So that's something we mix and, you know, it, and it takes investment, uh, privacy, security. There's a whole bunch of things that go into it. It's not an abstract thing. It's actually very concrete and specific. And so we've made a ton of investments in user trust. I think A, because we care about our users and want to earn their trust, but also because I think in the age of AI, it's really, it's more important now than before to really enable that trusted partnership because there's a lot of data moving moving around in this world of AI. It's so true. You know, um, a lot of the success over the past year in, in generative AI has actually been on the consumer side, not, not yet on the enterprise side. I think for the reason you're saying, I think in order for this technology to be deployed in the enterprise, which I, I think is where everyone ultimately believes is the most opportunity. Yeah you got to have that trust, right? And so you have to have like many, many layers of security and privacy that I think per your point for a lot of teams, is it's going to take some time to yeah. do it correctly. So um, yeah. it's such a good point. You know, talk, your point about from going from the browser to Grammarly made me realize, you know, by by amassing uh, such a, a scaled user base of Grammarly, you're, you're, in, you're in like this really interesting position uh, in the user's workflow to now, do some really interesting things with AI and yeah. LLMs, right? We talked about the core uh, product and the and the main yeah. thing that Grammarly does earlier in the conversation, but like, what can that what can that access layer now be a wedge for through yeah. AI? Yeah, so it's super interesting, right? I mean, you think about uh, people are expecting a ton of efficiency gains through AI. You look at uh, you know the suppliers of AI companies like Nvidia, incredible. Like, there's just there's a presumption built in that the demand is very strong and the demand is going to be predicated on tons of efficiency gains. And the question is, where do those efficiency gains come from? And it's very clear on the supply side that we're going to produce a ton of compute. But I feel like it's pretty nebulous on the demand side where the efficiency gains actually will come from. I think coding is one clear use case. I think it's because it's quite easy to measure and it's uh, kind of, uh, you know, engineering is, is a very kind of, well-defined set of telemetry and metrics and engineers, early adopters, high value demographic. But I think that's going to happen everywhere. And so when I think about the world of AI and kind of how it's getting deployed, here's kind of some observations I have. Uh, and actually it's backed up by data, but forget the data for a second. Just imagine our own experience, right? So I'm a knowledge worker, professional. I spend more than half my work week just communicating with other people. And in fact, engaging in written communication with other people across a wide variety of tools. I'm writing in so many different text boxes. I'm writing in Slack, in Gmail, in Word, in Salesforce. Uh, we use a tool for candidate feedback when we're hiring people. All these different places I'm writing, I'm writing in, in different contexts. And the data suggests that we are spending more time, like that time we spend writing is going up um, and we are increasingly fragmented across an ever wider array of tools because, you know, people want best of breed tools to run their business. Totally. So you got kind of, you got that one reality, right? And I think we all live it. Then you've got the other reality of I'm consuming a lot of information. 
I'm reading all of these documents and I'm reading all of these messages and all of the candidate feedback and all this stuff. And I can barely keep track of it. Like it's a lot. So you put those two things together and then you say, all right, so now let's imagine AI gets deployed in every single text box that I'm writing in. You've reduced the cost of content creation to zero or near zero. Simple law of supply and demand. There's going to be a lot more content. Like you're going to get 10x yep. more content. That's a horrible outcome. Like who's going to read this stuff? Not me. <laughs> I'm like, can barely keep up as it is. And so I feel like that is not the path. I feel like that is not the path to actually get the efficiency gains that everyone is hoping for. Um, so the reason I the reason I kind of say all of that is this is the path at Grammarly. We are this layer across all of your fragmented business applications. And that position gives us a couple of ways to help you as, a, as an end user. So one is we can give you a consistent user experience. So you're not navigating through, okay, what is Google's AI thing again? And what is Microsoft's AI thing again? And what's this other company's AI thing? It's like, it's a consistent thing, no matter what tool you're using. And then because so much of our work is fragmented across all these different apps, we can start connecting the dots mm. and bringing context along across all these different apps. Um, so we've actually done some interesting things in this regard. One of my favorite examples of that at Grammarly is this feature we launched called Knowledge Share, where if you're, you're reading a document and you come across some project code name or some, uh, some acronym and you don't know what it is, uh, Grammarly will highlight that term for you and kind of you hover over it and it will share information. This is what it is. Here's a link to the Confluence page that has more information. Here are the people you can connect. And so we're starting to bring that context to where people need it uh, in their communication flows. Imagine it can pull from a number of data sources, right? Like maybe it can pull from your email, from your docs. That's right. That's right. Messages. Because we're already in all of those different sections. Right. Yeah. So we're seeing how you're doing your work. And so we can use that to help you do your work better. So that's kind of the, uh, that's the, that's the exciting thing about Grammarly's opportunity in the world of AI. Yeah, it seems like it could really solve that that problem on the demand side that that you talked about and yeah. driving more efficiency on the demand. I I, I wonder, um, you know, if we're not even I'm not even talking specifically about grammar grammarly here, yeah. though I am thinking about your mission, improving lives by improving communication. Do you think through AI over time, communication becomes less human driven and more and more driven? by the LLM and like, how does, how does that square with the mission? Like, is that okay? If, if we're, if we're actually like writing less, but you know, the, the technology is writing or communicating on our behalf. Yeah, that's a, I think that is a thorny question. That's something I think about a lot. Yeah. Uh, I certainly don't want a future in which we outsource our writing to LLMs. Yeah. Um, I think writing is thinking. Certainly that's, it is for me. And just like I don't want to outsource my thinking, I don't want to outsource my writing. Yeah. Um, I think the nature of how we write will change though. Like today, it's basically, I've got a blank page and I have to start coming up with things and maybe I have writer's block and I'm struggling, et cetera. I think in the future, these AI assistants, Grammarly or just other AI assistants will move to much more of a co-creation model. So we're going to co-create with you. Like, what do you want to say? Well, what is your purpose here? What is your goal? And like, uh, you, you kind of engage in this higher level dialogue. And then, you know, maybe the LLM will generate something and you look at it, you critique it, and then maybe it'll update it. And so you've not outsourced. You need to be, have a lot of agency in this process and you need to engage in this dialogue, but then it's going to be a lot easier to produce the words as an outcome of this dialogue. And I think that's right. great. Um, I see this happening with coding. I think coding is a great, like, to me, it's a good lens into what the future might look like for everyone else. Because you, you know, you go to, from an IDE that has nothing or maybe some boilerplate template text code to, hey, I want to just, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to accomplish. And, you know, GitHub Copilot is generating some code. You're engaging back and forth. And I think that is going to be a much more widespread way of interacting with our tools. It almost becomes, it sounds like less outsourcing your writing or your communication to an LLM and more like, well, now you have this, you have these superpowers, you have yeah. a second brain, 
right? And and now you, exactly. you can do more um, that you're in control of, but you can just do so much more. Exactly. Is that, is that how you think about it? That, that's how I think about it. I really believe this technology is uh, something that augments us and actually really want to steer us. And I really believe that AI should steer in that direction. This is not about displacement. This is about augmentation. Um, I mean, which company says, I don't want to, you know, go after more sales prospects. Uh, which company says, no, no, I got too much going on already. I don't want to do more. Every, every, all of us have a big ambition. We want to do a lot of things. We don't have enough people to do it. And if you can give people superpowers, we can accomplish a lot. We can accomplish a lot more. That's what the technology enables for us. How much of, of what gets done here ends up being the result of just larger and larger and larger models to handle anything and everything versus much smaller models that are maybe small models that are that are that are that are trained basically for you specifically, right? Rahul's model. And this model, yeah. it's the best at helping Rahul. It's not that it's yeah. not the best at helping every everyone in the world. It's yeah. yours. Yeah. And if 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 the latter is is a place where we end up, like how does that potentially change the, the business models uh that are being deployed across AI right now? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I think there's no clear view on it. My personal feeling is there are going to be specialized trained models um, and it's not going to be just one very large model. Although you never know, like I feel like with every new generation of LLMs, yeah, new emergent properties uh, are demonstrated that kind of no one really expected. So never quite know, but my belief right now is they're going to be specialized models. So there's going to be models for specific tasks. There's going to be one model that's tailored to you across your tasks. And these models will instantiate, like you can think of these things as like almost like agent workflows. And so there's different agents. There's an agent for me, there's an agent that does HR processes. And these agents are talking to each other. It's almost like a new API across mm. the different applications um, to get work done. And they can actually complete tasks autonomously uh, on my behalf. And I think to we'll move to increasingly with this. So like the biggest kind of, Palpable change, I feel, for us as end users will be something along the lines of, number one, I'm interacting with my tool in a much more high-level, abstract manner than before. I'm kind of saying it high-level things and engaging in this dialogue, which is new. It's not a way that I normally do things. And then the other thing is, I think my agent will start doing things for me and start talking to other agents to get that right. done. Like, imagine an interesting insight where your agent says, you know, you actually haven't had uh, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with this person for a while. You've canceled the last two one-on-one -on -one meetings. My insight to you is you're overdue for having this conversation. And oh, like, that's a great insight. And then your agents can easily then at that point say, all right, I will go set it up. And maybe there's a calendar agent sitting there and my agent goes talks to the calendar agent and talks to your calendar agent and sets up the meeting. So I feel like those will increasingly become kind of how work gets done. Do you imagine a world in which Grammarly could expand beyond communication as a mission and start taking on some of these more agentic properties of meeting scheduling or setting up one-on-ones or, or, or is it your focus to only be in the communication vertical? We are not, we don't feel like we need to be constrained in any way. For right now, we support our users in communication. We are the domain experts. We can really help people. Yeah. But we're always guided by user what, what our users need. And so in the future, if we find that our position is this horizontal layer and the insights we get from our from our knowledge of what a user is doing and uh, our desire to advocate on the user's behalf, if that leads us in a position that is more expansive, we'll just follow that because we kind of follow our users. I wonder if Grammarly could uh, could help me as a user communicate in different modalities, right? Moving beyond just text, which is where you focus now to say, helping me communicate across audio or across video. Is that something you think about? Absolutely. We think about it uh, a lot. There's nothing magic. We do text only today, but there's nothing magical about text only. The same underlying technologies enable us to move beyond text. LLMs are multimodal now. And so by that uh, underlying support, we can certainly extend our support. For us, the 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 kind of the space in which we can provide value to users, multimodal, you can even think of multi-language, mm. is very large. And so for us, it's really about making sure we are very focused 
delivering end-to-end value, delivering user value at every step along the way. The I think sometimes when you, you are faced with a very large opportunity or, or a big disruption like AI, the risk, I've seen this in my in my experience as well, is you go super broad, super quickly, and then you kind of like half solve like 50 different problems. Yeah. And so uh, we're going to stay away from that because... Uh, that's not a path to success. Yeah. Spe- speaking of that, um, you know, what are some what are some things outside of Grammarly scope, but within AI right now that are really exciting to you? You know, what are you seeing in the market the, that you you know really really gets you excited about the future? You know, I think more broadly. So, like at a high level, uh, I, I'm just a tech optimist, and I really believe in the power of tech to improve things. And for a while there, there was kind of this odd, like doomer kind of thing. And what's your P doom? And it was yeah. super unhelpful. I'm just, it feels like it's dying down now, which is, which is great. Um, there's an element of being responsible. I think that's important, but it's not this uh, very abstract idea. These are, these are practical things you got to do to be a responsible deployer of AI services. Uh, but look at the positives, right? Look at the, I, I just see the incredible potential of AI in, uh, enabling science to be done better. Um, there's this question of, can we do meta studies uh, just through an LLM? Like, let's take, let's survey the literature and understand and abstract away and understand like, what do we know about Alzheimer's? Or what do we know about some big pressing problem? And I actually see already driving massive changes. I mean, AlphaFold is a great example of science being done better through AI. And I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg on what's possible there. So I think that is fantastic. One of the interesting things that's emerging is um, this idea of reasoning capabilities and the idea of like more and more sophisticated multi-step reasoning uh, as an emergent property of uh, of uh, these large language models. And uh, I think that really opens a, a ton of new, interesting, more sophisticated use cases. So you know, think about like I'm collecting the literature on a very complicated scientific issue, maybe it's oncology, and I have a I have the ability to reason through complicated multi-step processes, and I can process all this data on the latest on cancer research. I think uh, the sky's the limit on what's possible there. It, actually, it's really a, it's a super exciting time. It really is. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, any uh, maybe last mi- last minute question? Uh, any yeah. any predictions on? What may be some of the emergent properties of some of these new models that are that are coming down the the pike that 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 are rumored to launch soon? Um, I think I, I'm not sure. I I feel like my sense, at least, is it's going to be more about kind of extending the existing architectures, larger context windows, yep. more sophisticated multi-step reasoning. My sense, at least, is the current set of architectures. Uh, with the current set of training data kind of processes, we're kind of almost running out of training data in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I don't think, we, my feeling is we're not going to see some step change difference. Uh, I think we're just going to see improvements, incremental improvements, not so incremental, but improvements along these same axes. Uh, yeah. More sophisticated reasoning, more ability to pass context into every single prompt, those kinds of things, which which is great. It enables new things. But actually, I also think that there is a role for new architectures to emerge from this. At the end of the day, despite all this awesomeness, it is a singular architecture. It's all based on transformers. It's all based on backpropagation. If you want to get really technical about it, it's one thing uh, to reduce the you know the error gradient. And so I think we could do more. We could maybe learn more from biological systems and find different ways of taking the same draining data, but being more efficient in how we learn from it. So I, I think there's many other dimensions. Today, it feels like data is the only dimension, but I actually feel like there's many other dimensions in which we could you know, kind of advance the technology. Yeah, so maybe, maybe we're gonna see teams um, continue to focus on scaling um, yeah. as the main thing within the current architectures. But yeah. at a certain point, per your point, maybe we're going to start to asymptote and then and then we really have to start to think about some some new architecture. And even if we don't asymptote, I just think it's nice. I, I feel like yeah. it feels like there's a lot of opportunity there. Like, why is it just one algorithm and one architecture? They should yeah. be, you know. For sure. 
Yeah. Uh, Raul, this is a fascinating conversation. I, I learned a ton. I'm very confident the audience is going to as well. So I really, really appreciate you making the time. Uh, yeah, thanks for speaking is, with me today. This is really fun. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Let's do it again sometime. Thanks, Raul. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to Generative Now. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review the episode. That really helps. If you'd like to learn more, follow Lightspeed at Lightspeed VP on YouTube, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Generative Now is produced by Lightspeed in partnership with Pod People. I am Michael Mignano, and we will be back next week. See you then.